Hi, I'm Joe Hupsey, and I'm here with my colleague Bob Kirshen, a Cadence R&D fellow, and we're here to talk about formal engine technology. He's the leader of the formal engine team. So, Bob, um, first just tell us about yourself. Hi, Joe. Uh, so I came from Bell Labs Research, where I spent the major part of my career, and along the, li along the way, I developed uh, Formal Check, which was one of the first commercial model checking tools, and in 1998, this had, was licensed to Cadence for uh, commercial purposes, and three years later, I followed it into Cadence, uh, and since then, uh, as you say, I've been leading the Formal Engines team. Uh, the formal engines team until today it supports five different products for a, a range of applications from formal verification to uh, constraint solving for guided random simulation and uh, a variety of other applications. Indeed. Now what are some of the challenges or trade-offs when you're developing a formal engine versus say simulation technology? Well, the relationship between formal verification and simulation uh, is very interesting. Historically, uh, they were antagonistic. Uh, the uh, formal verification community were the young whippersnappers, and they had this um, absurd notion early on that they were going to displace simulation. Uh, the simulation community viewed the formal verification community as, uh, as acad academic know-nothings okay. who uh, ha had uh, very idealized but useless notions. But along the way, I think both communities have developed considerable respect for one another. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, the um, formal verification community has seen uh, enormous value in implementing ideas and techniques from simulation, for example, to allow you to get deep into a design before you turn on your formal verification engine. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, um, I think that there are ideas from formal verification which will soon be making their way into simulation, namely abstraction, in order to improve uh, performance and capacity of the simulator, uh, uh, in order to improve uh, performance and coverage of the simulator. So in short, they, they really shouldn't be seen as uh, conflicting, they're really reinforcing. Yeah, and I think today we already see that there's uh, so much synergy between these two that uh, they have become companions in the, um, in the same development and marketplace world. Indeed. What are some of the challenges and or trade-offs in creating a formal engine? So the, the, the classical trade-off in a formal engine is uh, power or capacity versus automation. Uh, historically, when people were not that familiar with formal verification, it was very important to have the formal verification be as automated as it possibly could, mm -hmm. but this was at the expense of the size of designs that could be formally verified and also uh, the extent of verification that was possible, usually uh, uh, restricting it to block level. Today, as more and more people become converse, conversant with formal verification, uh, we are able to uh, use semi-automated methods, uh, uh, apply people's expertise, and thus uh, significantly increase the capacity of designs we're able to formally verify. So, in other words, you know, with just a little bit of methodology, you can really increase the capacity that formal can tackle. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, uh, you, you get a kind of exponential uh, uh, growth of the uh, capacity of designs uh, uh, together as a function of the, um, uh, the, the extent to which you're willing to apply semi-automated uh, methods. Because if you are willing to, say, do some form of decomposition or assume guarantee reasoning, then you can process over a design in a in a more or less uh, linear fashion and avoid what would be an exponential explosion of design size and thereby overcome an inherent capacity limitation. Interesting, interesting. Let, let me kind of narrow the focus here to a specific case. It's a, a popular topic now is cache coherency. And, and you know, what can you tell me some of the issues are, especially some of the key misunderstandings? I think people are or you know, might have some misunderstandings, or they're kind of missing the boat on this, what should people look out for? So cache coherency verification is a classical case of not asking yourself the meta question 
of what is the question to which this, this cash protocol is the answer. Uh, typically, when people seek to do cash coherency verification, they are seeking to verify the implementation of one or another particular cash protocol. Mm -hmm. Cash protocols can be extremely complicated, and they have many moving parts and many very delicate pieces. There are, are components which are subject to race conditions and glitches mm -hmm. and various other delicacies. And when all is said and done, even if you succeed to fully verify the implementation of your cash protocol against some ideal spec of that cash protocol, you really don't know that you've achieved the level of memory consistency which you're mm -hmm. seeking in the first place. Uh, a far better approach would be to write a specification of the, mem the memory consistency that you are seeking mm -hmm. and then use that to indirectly verify your cache protocol. That way you both avoid this uh, potential pitfall of not verifying what you really need to verify. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, uh, specification of cache consistent, uh, of memory consistency is, uh, turns out to be far easier than specifying and verifying the components of a cache coherence protocol. Interesting. Well, thanks, Bob, for taking the time to share your insights. Uh, my pleasure. Thanks, Joe.